Good morning. Are you warm enough yet? No and yes. Well, huddle a little closer then if you're not yet. But if you are, then you are... What's that? Come close to me. I'm always not. Okay. Then you are standing in the embrace of the God that loves us and cares for each and every one of us. Welcome to worship this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we, we are especially grateful for your presence. And uh, we welcome those who may be watching online. I continue to hear good things about our live stream. And uh, we want to recognize uh, the Whitens family who are supporting the web ministry this week in Thanksgiving for sunshine. Yeah, nothing about warmth though, but plenty, plenty of sunshine. We've had a lot of that. Um, if you want to support that web ministry and our live streaming capability, there's a sign-up board right outside the sanctuary that allows you to indicate your desire to su support that vital ministry. We've stepped up what we're doing in our web ministry this year. And so your support really does truly touch the world. And that is an amazing, amazing thing. We gather this morning to worship. We gather this morning to open our eyes eyes and hearts to what God is doing in our midst. The scriptures say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on, and that's something I want you to keep as our theme. But worship in it is really about encountering the very presence of the living God. <laughs> So we gather in the embrace of a God who loves us and pours God's help on for us to, to just do the same in return and, and perhaps listen in silence, listen in prayer. But I want to share some things people have written for uh, joys and concerns, and I'll just repeat. Uh, Bertha, you said Wesley's home and doing great, correct? Beautiful little Wesley. That's awesome. Not to nip and tuck for a little bit there, but God has been helpful. Yeah. But after um, yeah. the congregation, my church family started praying, it was a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. miracle. Thank you. Somebody wrote in the joys, I am alive and saved by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Oh, hey, come on now. Yeah. Amen or yeehaw, right? We do that around here. Happy birthday to Glenda Abadi. So, happy birthday. You get younger every year. It's a good thing. We want to pray for Becky, who is uh, undergoing chemo. We want to keep praying for Gordon, of course, as uh, he continues his cycles of chemotherapy for his cancer, Gordon. Uh, and then uh, Tom Anderson is coming home at noon today. He actually drove himself to the hospital the other day, but uh, they finally got to the bottom of it. And so we're grateful for that and keep him in our prayers. I got a, a message from uh, Nikki Perkins yesterday about a young boy named Julian Ross. He's nine years old and has a form of cancer and they discovered um, when they were going out of state for some experimental hopeful treatment as they did a CAT scan on him that the cancer had just exploded off of his body. And so his family comes home, I believe today, uh, to hospice care. And so I want you to pray for Julian Ross and his family. Interestingly enough, she says that the community in Oswego is going to have a, I can't remember the exact term she called it, um, a love showing for them, where they're inviting people in the community to go to their residence and gather outside their house and pray and just let him know how much he is loved at this time in their life. And I thought, what a powerful gift that is. So pray for Julian. And, uh, Mary Hamer. For shoulder surgery, thank you. In uh, recovery, thank you. Let's pray. 
Oh, excuse me. Jim Bishop is here. No, he's not here. I apologize. <laughs> but uh, good surgery reports, at least so far. So we're glad. The doctor says the healing is a miracle. How well it's going. So all the prayers, thank you so yes. much. They're working. She said the doctor said the healing is something that has surprised them and almost miraculous. So let's keep Jim in our prayers. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's a note here from uh, Lauren Jim Bishop. Praise God for the web ministry and for our loving church. Everybody turn around and wave because my hunch is they are live streaming and say we're praying for you all. That's an awesome gift we can do. And uh, they can actually chat online during the middle of the service. What a great service we offer. What a great ministry. So um, let's pray. Boy, it's cold outside, God, but you know what? We are warm in your house. We are warm by your grace. We struggle. We have difficulties. We know people. We love people who are in the midst of sickness and disease and brokenness of mind and body and soul. Yet, your grace never stops. Your love doesn't end. And you embrace us and walk with us. We may have lots of questions, oh God, about purpose and plans. And we may dot our sentences with exclamations of why, oh God, but you still draw close to us and embrace us and prepare us for healing. It's not always physical. But when our hearts are open, when we allow our spirits and souls to, to be open to awe and reverence and awareness, our souls become whole. And it changes everything. Everything. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We ask, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, for your hand to be upon that young boy, Julian Ross, and his family. I can't even imagine what they must feel and be going through, but may they be sustained and may they notice your amazing, amazing grace and comforting presence in this most, most painful time. We thank you for moving among your people for a chance to wake up on a Sunday morning and just be grateful that we are alive and well by the grace of God. God, you call us to more. You call us to deeper. You call us to richer. You, you call us, as we learned last week, into the deep waters of life where, where the uncomfortable places are, where the unconventional lies, where where the marginalized and broken live, not in the shallow winds of our comfortable places, but in the deep places where we have to trust in you as we move out. We have neighbors. We have friends who don't know you. And so, Lord, we lift the name loved ones and neighbors and friends who need to know of your healing power and amazing grace. We lift their names to you now. May those names stay in our spirits. May we pray with them May we find moments to share with them. May we find opportunities to invite them to come and share what the grace of God is doing. Prepare our hearts and our minds for the goodness as we gather around your table and hear your word and sing your praise. So that at the end of the day or the end of the hour or Maybe as we may even approach
approach the end of life, we cannot help but find our soul crying out in thanksgiving. It is well. It is well. It is well. This we ask in the name of Jesus. So what do I got in here? It's not tomato soup. What is this? What do you think is in here? ABC soup. Not quite. It's Chef Boyardee mini dinosaurs. It's food, by the way. It's like SpaghettiOs, but better. It's got dinosaurs in it. And what's in here? Kidney beans. Mmm, who likes kidney beans? You do, great. Now, are you sure that that's what's in here? How do you know what's in here? Because it has a label. It has a label. And but you don't know because other people like use stuff over and over again, but it's still something. Right. That means that. It's sealed, so there's got to be kidney beans in here because that's what the label says, right? Well, let's check it out. See if the label is right before I pull my microphone off my head. Okay, here we go. Let's see. We're looking for what here? Kidney beans. Kidney, Kidney beans. beans. Thank you. And we open it up. I should have brought a bowl to pour it out because it's all juice at the top. All right. All right. Does that look like kidney beans in there? Yes. It does? No. What do you think it is? The, the, the dinosaur. 
It's a dinosaur. What are the dinosaurs doing in kidney beans? And that's kidney beans. Uh, you think so? All right, well, let's find out. Well, yeah, I'm going to spill that too. Why is this thing in trouble? Did you change the label? Did I change the label? Maybe. All right, let's find out if these are. So if that's not kidney beans, and this probably isn't what? So it's probably going to be what? All right, tell me it. What's ooh? What's in here? Kidney beans. Mmm. Oh, Black kidney beans. <laughs> All right. So, but the label said it had kidney beans in it. In that one, and the label said that had dinosaurs in it. What's wrong? They're not matched. They're not matched, are they? See, this is to tell us something. Sometimes we make judgments about what other people are like on the inside, one at a time please, by what we see on the outside, don't we? We sometimes judge what we think people are like by what they wear or the color of their skin or how they act, but we really don't know what people are like on the inside unless we talk to them and ask them, correct? And for adults, that's a, that's a way of reminding adults that we really don't know what someone is walking through, the difficulties they have, unless we spend time and find out what's really going on on the inside. And for us kids, it's a reminder that just because of how someone looks on the inside doesn't tell us anything about what's on, on the outside, doesn't tell us anything about what's on the inside. So it's a reminder to not judge. Jesus said, judge, don't judge others, and you won't be judged. Thank you, Rich. That's very helpful, and I'm just going to make a mess, so I'm just going to leave them right there if I try to pour them out. So, so let's remember, just because it says or someone looks like something on the outside, we need to get to know them to find out what's on the inside. Let's pray. Say, dear God. Thank you for loving us and for reminding us just because of how someone looks or the color of their skin or where they live, you ask us not to judge them. You invite us to get to know them and find out what's really on the inside. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, Push out into the water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done, a huge haul of fish straining the nets beyond capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I am a sinner and cannot handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, working with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up onto the beach, left them, nets and all, and followed him. The next reading is Psalm 111. I give thanks to God with everything I've got. Wherever good people gather and in the congregation, God's works are so great, worth a lifetime of entertain, a lifetime of study, enjoys endless enjoyment. Splendid in beauty, mark his craft, his generosity never gives out. His miracles are his memorial, this God of grace, this God of love. He gave food to those who fear him. He remembered to keep his ancient promise. He moved he proved to his people that he could do what he said, hand them the nations on a platter, a gift. He manufactures truth and justice. 
All his products are guaranteed to last, never out of date, never obsolete, and rust proof. All that he makes and does is honest and true. He paid the ransom for his people. He ordered his covenant kept forever. He's so personal and holy, worthy of our respect. The good life begins in the fear of God. Do that and you'll know the blessing of God. His hallelujah lasts forever. And now God's people say. Amen. What was that verse? The good life begins in what? In the fear of God. Let's pray a minute. Open our hearts and open our minds to something new and something different. And yet something that touches us and drives us to our knees before you, God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. And all God's people say, That Greek word, the, the Old and the New Testament was translated, the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek, and the New Testament was mostly written in Greek. And when they were translated from Greek to the English, what you begin to realize is that word in Greek that, said, that, that, that is translated as fear, or is also can be translated as awe. Phobos is the kind of Greek uh, description of that word. And it means both fear and awe. And so in Acts chapter 2 verse 43 when the new church is just forming and growing and developing Acts 43 says when the Holy Spirit was moving in the room and people were amazed and were moving outside of themselves in generosity Acts 43 is recorded as saying in the New Revised Standard Version in awe filled the whole room. But then you read in the King James Version, the King James Version records it as in fear, the room was filled with fear. So which is it? Is it awe? Or is it fear? I wonder if it's really both. That in moments of awe, we also are encountering our deepest disconnect from God. In moments of awe, when we feel most connected to God, we also may be invited and experience our deepest disconnect from God. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? Any? How was it? It was awesome. Yeah, that's right. Everything is awesome. As from the Lego movie, sorry. Okay, so what was it like? I, I, I went when I was five years old, and I can't remember it for the life of me. Deep. It was deep. I did see the Grand Canyon. I saw the Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania. Now that's in Tioga County, if you've ever been to Tioga County. And, and I was taking the long way to Harrisburg and, and driving around along Route 6 in the fall, one of those beautiful, crisp, blue fall days when the mountains were lit up with the majesty and color and glory of God's creation. And I had to pull my car over at one of those rest stops and, and go to one of the overlooks and I just stood there amazed and in awe and just struck by the beauty. Have you ever had a moment like that? When, when you were just struck by the beauty and that sense of holiness in which you had invited, been invited into. It wasn't long, though, before that sense of awe and, and being in something holy beyond myself got changed into a sense of sadness. I, I felt tears coming to my eyes because I, I wanted to take that home with me. You know, I wanted to bottle it up. I wanted to be in that place forever. But guess what? We can't, can we? And I became aware that I'm a creature and not the Creator. And there's some kind of a disconnect that doesn't allow me to be in that place all of the time. 
In fact, I grew more sad because out of that experience, I started to reflect on my life and I became aware of all of my imperfections, the places in my life where I really feel I had sucked as a father and I stunk as a husband. And here I was in the middle of holiness and amazement and beauty, and yet it wasn't long before I found myself in that place of disconnect with God. Maybe that's what Peter was going through. Remember the story that Meg just read to us. Jesus is done teaching, and Peter and the others are cleaning their nets, and he tells them to go out into the deeper water. We talked about that last week, and put their nets down. And, and Peter's a little frustrated. He said, Lord, we've been out here all night, and we've caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll do it. And he does it, and he lays his nets down into the deeper waters, and this humongous catch comes up. He is overwhelmed by this. It is a powerful blessing for him. He is amazed. There's so much fish that he has to call his friends to come and help. And then at one point, that sense of amazement, that sense of being in a blessing and a holiness gets switched for him, doesn't it? And he's driven to his knees. In a very vulnerable moment, he cries out, Away from me, Lord, I am a sinner. I am not worthy of this kind of place, this kind of experience. How vulnerable he must have felt. I mean, first off, he felt vulnerable because here he is driven to his knees in, in utter amazement of his sense of disconnect, of his humanness, how much, how much his life really sucked. And there are his friends fishing with him. Imagine what they were going to talk about over beers at the tavern. <laughs> but he feels most vulnerable because there he is before God, pouring his soul out. And what is God going to do with that? What is Jesus going to do with that? I mean, is Jesus going to pile on and wave a finger and say, Ah, Peter, not this time, buddy. Or is he going to get on Facebook and just kind of pile on this difficult place that he's on? Yeah, you are bad, man. What does Jesus do? He moves towards Peter. And doesn't pile on, but instead says, Don't be afraid. You are being made new for something more. The world that we live in needs the authentic encounter and vulnerability that comes from the encounter with Jesus. Wouldn't it be good if we had the courage? To get down on our knees sometimes. To be honest about our humanness. To admit our wrong. To, to courage to be real with people. The courage to be humble. The courage to admit we really are not in control. The courage to cry out for help. The courage to say, Jesus, I really stink sometimes. Can... Dobson is the past Kent Dobson is a pastor of the Marshall Bible Church. In a podcast I heard him share this week, he said this. He says, We are estranged from our own wholeness. He said, We are made in the image of God. We have this spark of the divine in each and every one of us. That's that's our birthright. That's our DNA. But he says, But but then we also feel so estranged from that place. And we try to fix this separation in all kinds of ways, accumulate all kinds of things, trying to fill that dawn hole we've talked about before with something and nothing can fill it. And he says, what Jesus has come to do is to heal that estrangement that we harbor in our hearts. Isn't that what the church should be about? Isn't that what we should be focused on. 
to offer healing in the name of Jesus, to be honest in our humanness, to be confessional in our vulnerability as we cry out for help, to be to be healing, to, to point out healing comes through the surrender of our lives to the healing power of Jesus. Now I've lived here long enough in this area of upstate New York among you to know that, that you, if I can say you, I'm among you now, but I'm going to say you, are some hardy people. <laughs> From November to April, you take on the elements, don't you? And you use snowmobiles and you hunt and you live and play off the land as much as you can. And, and you are not just survivors, man. We are thrivers, aren't we? Man, we take on the elements and the challenges. We take on the economic changes in this whole community over the years. And we're not just surviving lots of times. We're thriving. And you celebrate the culture of of independence and the power to make your own decisions. But we're also hurting people. We're also people struggling and wrestling. Shouldn't this be a place where we can welcome people to an honest, authentic encounter with Jesus? And welcome each other as broken people in need of healing. The place where broken people can come in need of repair. The place where broken people can come in need of hope. The place of broken people would come, not for pity uh, pity sayings to help us in tough times, but with honest, authentic companionship and a willingness to say, I will walk with you on the journey. I can't give you healing, but I can point you to the one who can heal you in your greatest need. The world needs what we know. The world needs what we know about an honest, vulnerable encounter with Jesus. It's said that in Africa there's a, a tribe that has a very unique way of, of practicing discipline for their community and their tribe. That what happens when someone hurts someone, when someone steals or violates some moral code in the, in the village that, that really begins to cast a negative movement among the village, what they do is they put that person in the middle of their village and everyone in the tribe circles all around them. And they rear back. And guess what they throw at that person? Reminders. Not about what they did, but what they throw at that person is the things they know about that person that was good and decent and merciful and compassionate that they had seen them do in their life. As a way of not only letting them know that they loved them and would forgive them, but reminding them of who they are in the very true love of God. How about us? How are we doing at that? What are the, what are the things we are throwing at people we are reminding about themselves? What are the things we are showing people about the source of power for the healing in our lives that we all desperately seek and our friends are longing for? As you come to communion today, two questions. What is keeping you? From opening your heart to the one that brings healing. And what is preventing you from being an example and model of the healing grace of Christ in this world?
Take us into this world of God of all creation and lover of our hearts. May we be bold and courageous in our witness. May we be bold and courageous in our inviting. May our lives be a living testimony to your healing power and grace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.